Well, welcome. Hello to everyone that I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet. Uh, this is uh, my session taken down a monolith, one package at a time. And uh, those who have never heard of me, my name is Kevin Griffin. I own a company called SwiftKick. We do software consulting uh, in the Microsoft space and web development space. So my primary focus is any Microsoft-based technology, .NET, .NET Core, uh, deploying to Microsoft Azure. Um, so I'm also the guy that has written the training material for the Build Master and ProGit uh, workshops you'll see tomorrow. Um, so if you don't like them, totally blame me. That's all right. Um, if you ever want to chat with me afterwards, feel free. Um, my email address is up here on the slide and it'll be on the videos as well. I would love to chat with you, uh, whether it's about this or anything else. Um, but I know I don't have too much time today, but I, I picked kind of a big topic and there's a lot I want to go into. So we'll, we'll take it the, the best way we can. And I'm a very conversational uh, presenter. So if you have a question and you want to go off topic for a moment, let's do that. Just let me know and we'll have a discussion. But what I like to cover in this session is talking about monolithic applications. I've had the displeasure of working in a lot of monoliths uh, in my career. And I want to talk about some of the techniques we've used uh, to decouple monoliths into individual packages and how packaging in general has helped us move um, to something that's a little bit more maintainable. Uh, so we'll talk about what packages are. I, I find that a, there's a good number of folks out there that don't really understand packaging as a, as a concept. So let's just cover the bases. What are packages? We'll talk about types of packages. And then we'll lead into a conversation of how does that help you as a developer or as a uh, person who's managing an infrastructure. And then we'll wrap it up with some Q&A and general discussion. So I actually added these slides this morning because I've, I've been spending a lot of time with this talk trying to get the narrative just right. And I want to start by talking about decoupling the monolith. So there's a, a couple things about monoliths. I do not like monolithic applications. Uh, in the 12 years I've been writing software professionally, uh, I have grown to loathe monoliths. And it's mostly because they're constantly growing and they're these very complex beasts. If you've worked in a monolithic application, go back to what Aaron was talking about this morning. Uh, they're, they're a house of cards. We use the exact same analogy. Um, and I was like, well, they're going to feel like I'm copying Aaron. And I am, but I copied Aaron before Aaron got up and presented. So I'm not really copying him. He just had the pleasure of going first. I've been spying on you for months. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> But the analogy is exactly correct. If you change one thing anywhere, you could possibly topple the entire card, uh, house of cards. So you might have an issue that you don't even realize for uh, days, if not weeks or months, because you, no one touches that part of the code. And that's one of the big problems with monoliths is the majority of applications we built that were monolithic, the features that we break are only used 2% of the time. And when someone actually goes and executes that piece of code, that's when everything fails. So in my consultancy, I prefer smaller testable bits of code. So not necessarily microservices. I don't like that as a buzzword, but I want things that I can uh, easily test and make small changes to. But they're things that have one very defined set of income or input and output. So I know exactly what it's doing. Uh, when it's doing it and how it's doing it. Uh, that way, if I need to make a change, I'm making a change to one little small piece and I'm not potentially taking down the entire house of cards. So in this uh, discussion, I want to talk about how can we take this house of cards and possibly start extracting things into smaller, testable, less fragile pieces of software. And there's little steps that we can take while keeping the monolith. I'm not telling you to throw the monolith away. I'm telling you we should take steps to make it a little bit more manageable. And that leads us into a discussion of packages and packaging in general. And I have this great overview of what a package is and how it applies to your life, whether you're a developer or you're a release manager or ops person. So packaging basically comes down to applications are complicated. 
there's a lot of moving parts, just like an engine in a car. There's a lot of pieces that make that engine go. And you see the uh, slides I have here. On the left is a .NET Core application, which .NET Core is smaller, more maintainable, more, um, uh, more better in every way, but dang, there's a lot of files that go along with a deployment of a .NET Core application. Uh, on the right you have uh, NPM, Node Package Manager, which it doesn't stand for that anymore. They decided to drop the acronym, it's just NPM. But either way, it's a running joke that Node Modules in NPM is just this wastebasket of stuff and the stuff you need to run your application. But it just makes everything more complex as you have all these different dependencies. The old monolith I used to work on, um, onboarding new developers was a several day, if not several week task. Uh, I think you talked about this a little bit as well. When you have a new developer comes in, we, we didn't actually have a document. You just met with the lead developer and he'd go, it was almost this exact conversation. All right, now you gotta go to this UNC store, pull down this file because you have to reference it in your project because we can't figure out how to add that file to source control and just have it referenced automatically. And we get to step 42 and you go, oh crap, that's right, I forgot step three. You were supposed to go do this other thing that was completely unrelated and let's go back and do that. And two weeks later, I'm actually committing code to, to source where I should be able to commit code to source in maybe a matter of hours. I also have projects that, uh, everything we built was uh, in-house, it was first party. So anything that connected to databases, any uh, file management work that we did, it was all built in-house. And that's fine, but people have already uh, done this sort of work before. And we actually didn't think about this in a modular way. We created what I call the kitchen sink library. Uh, have you ever been on a project with a kitchen sink? Mm -hmm. Something dot utils? I've, number of projects I've walked into where uh, I have one I still manage uh, that I took on for maintenance as a dot util uh, assembly. They don't have the source code for it anymore. It manages all the data access. <laughs> so if I have an issue with data access, I have to be very confident that it's not a me, that it's not a, it's an issue with my code, not an issue with the uh, library code because I don't have the source for the library code. That was written 10 years ago and they lost the source code. Actually, I, uh, I uh, decompiled it. So I have the original source, but I don't have a good process for recompiling it. But thankfully, that code is never broken. I'm knocking on everything that could possibly be wood. Uh, so we have, have this package and this is the thing you have to go get. It's impossible to version. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, all right, oops, let me move on. So distribution is usually the big problem. Uh, when I went into my first consulting job, there literally was a UNC path that had all these dev utilities in it. And mine third to fifth step to 50th step was go get this package, install it, go get that package, install it. And when I say package, I really don't mean package. I mean, go get this DLL, go get these, uh, these pieces of code and copy them manually into your environments. And they magically will do something when everything's working, if everything works. But then versioning was an issue. So because this was all managed in house, it wasn't in any reliable form of management. We had the lead developer down the hall go, <laughs> he would send the email and I'll show a joke in a moment. Hey, I, I just fixed an issue. Go grab the latest version. So the dozen developers in house would go get that file and we would all have to update everything locally. So when you have this kitchen sink version that has everything in it, how do you, how do you uh, version that reliably? And the answer is you really can't. You have issues like this where it's an email that goes out that says, hey, go grab the latest version. And, you know, this is wrong in every sense of the word, but this also causes other issues. Because what if that new developer down the hall who just went through steps one through 50 uh, doesn't see this email and he's running an old version 
of the kitchen sink, and that kitchen sink has a SQL injection bug in it. So he's testing it against a bad version of the software. All right. So this leads us into a discussion of what packages are and how they can potentially help us. Uh, a package is just essentially a zip file. That's, that's the easiest way you can think about it. It's a file that contains other files. And depending on what type of package you're using, it might have binaries in it, it might have scripts, it might have um, uh, um, some sort of manifest. So I've used some NuGet packages that just have PowerShell scripts in them. And those PowerShell scripts go off and do things. But it's essentially just a way for me as a library developer or a tool developer to build something that you can then consume. Uh, more importantly, you can consume it or you can remove it successfully. Uh, because installing packages is one half of the equation, but what if you want to remove a package or want to upgrade a package? All that stuff is managed by the, the package in the package manager. And I'm going to use two terms uh, interchangeably, package manager and then feeds. Uh, we'll talk about ProGet, which is the whole reason I'm talking about packages today. Uh, they don't call it a package manager, it's their feeds uh, that have all the packages inside of them. But fundamentally, there's three types of packages uh, at, that you could possibly use in your development lifecycle. Uh, developer packages, so who are the developers in the room? Okay. So there, there's a good mix of talents here. So these are either third-party developers or third-party libraries that you use. So you probably <coughs> have used jQuery. Uh, I'm a .NET guy, so JSON.NET. If you've installed anything client-side, React, Angular, Vue. These are normally only installable by downloading a package and consuming that package. In the old days of web development, you would just go download the JavaScript file, drop it in a folder, and boom, you could use it. Now, you can't do that anymore. You download the package, you have to make sure your web pack is configured correctly, and then three, four hours later, everything might magically work. And these popular packages get deployed through package managers or through feeds. So NPM, NuGet, Ruby has gems. Um, there's a PowerShell gallery, there's, um, Python has what, uh, pip, um, there, there's a bunch of them out there. So every major language and platform probably has its own package manager associated with it. Second, you have application and component packages. These are things that you might use internally um, and that you're not putting out for public consumption. This is not open source stuff. This is stuff that's used internally. It has all the keys to the kingdom. I keep pressing the wrong button. Uh, so you're not gonna go to a public NPM uh, package manager to get these packages. You're not gonna go to NuGet to get these packages. These are ones you're gonna host in, inside. Well, because you can't host NPM internally or NuGet internally, how do you host that stuff? Well, you use a tool like ProGit, which is built for managing internal packages or private packages. Uh, and then there's some packages, like we'll talk about here towards the end, where maybe you want to package your entire web application uh, deployable as a package and then and push it out. Well, you're not going to do that as a NuGet package or as an NPM package. Uh, you need something that's a little bit more universal. Well, Anito has a tool called UPAC, or Universal Package, uh, that fits this model really well. And then third, we won't talk too much about this, but you have machine packages. Uh, these are mostly tools or utilities. So anyone use Chocolatey? Uh, Chocolatey is a, basically a machine package. They build on top of NuGet, so it's, it's all NuGet underneath the scenes, but it's just packages that contain scripts. I want to install 7-zip, so let me go install the chocolatey package for 7-zip. It goes and downloads the proper executable, does the install, everything's great. Mostly used by system administrators uh, to, to set up machines. Um, I have a list of chocolatey scripts I use anytime I bootstrap a new, new machine, so I get everything I need, Visual Studio, 7-zip, uh, all my different utilities, and it's really quick and easy. If you go to Chocolatey's uh, 
page and just search, people put up their scripts for starting a new development box, which is pretty interesting to see what tools people are using. Uh, but not just chocolatey. If anyone's using Docker, Docker is kind of like a machine package you know, in some sense of the word. Uh, PowerShell has its own gallery for different tools and utilities. Um, if you use Linux, you have uh, like AppGit, you have uh, RPM for Red Hat. Those are all package managers. And even to the same extent, I took the slide out, but anyone who has a mobile phone, if you use the Apple App Store or Android Store or Google Play, those are packages because you're not doing this complex installation on your mobile device. You're getting a package and it's going to run that package in a sandbox. Um, it, anyone who uses a Mac, if you ever installed apps by hand, uh, you basically just click a package and drag it into your applications folder, and boom, it's installed, you can run it. So we're, we're seeing more and more move to these machine packages uh, in our everyday life, even though we might not realize it. So what does this mean for me, uh, or for you, now let's talk about the two fundamental reasons why you would want to use packages in your development life cycle. Uh, the first one is really reduction or reducing the amount of code that you write. So if you have one monolithic application, you might actually have like two or three monolithic applications. And if you're like any environment I've been in, they share code. But they share code because someone said, well, I've done that already over here. Let me copy and paste that into project B. Well, if I have code that exists in more than one place, uh, I could reduce the amount of code that I'm writing by putting it into a package. Uh, but that also brings us into reuse. So if I'm writing code in multiple places, if I can reduce the amount of code I'm writing by packaging it up, I can then reuse it in multiple places without having to reinvent the wheel over and over again. So let's look at a sample. Uh, this is Kevin's fake monolithic application. We'll call it number one because I'm going to show you two. Uh, you have your app, you have a database. There's a data access layer that knows how to talk to the database. But then what's this application do? Uh, so I write a lot of web applications. I usually have an authentication layer. I have some random business logic. I have email. I have credit card processing because we do some e-commerce stuff. Uh, I have to manage users, so is uh, permissions, rights, uh, passwords. A bunch of background processes, so stuff that needs to happen when people aren't using the application or anything that needs to happen every minute or every hour. Uh, then I might have a caching layer so I don't have to talk to the database every, every single request. So there's a lot of stuff that's happening here. Well then let's look at monolithic application number two. And, uh, most consulting uh, engagements I've done, they look like this. There's monolithic app one and monolithic app two, which is essentially rinse, repeat. Um, it's <laughs> database, data access, all the other credit that goes inside. The only thing that might be different is the random business logic and <coughs> the background processes that we're doing. But everything else is essentially the same, or it can be abstracted out into its own individual uh, use case. Well, consulting company I'm not going to name had monolithic app one, monolithic app two, and how did we code against these different code bases? Well, I had the pleasure of working in both the code bases, uh, and so did six other developers uh, on, our, on our hall, and this would happen. I would make an update to one of the sections, and the conversation would go, hey, I fixed the bug, there was a bug with sending email. If we didn't do this correctly, uh, it would fail. And they go, great. Let's copy that over to application two. So we go over to application two and physically copy and paste the code over. Uh, and boom, we now have fixed that bug in both places it was being used. And then likewise, in application two, some, we fix a bug and say caching. Well, we need to move that code over into the other application because we essentially copy and pasted everything between these two apps. And likewise, it's just back and forth. You fix something in one, uh, one side, you have to copy it over to the other application. Uh, and it's back and forth. And that's because, and almost, it's not even exactly like that. There are cases where maybe if I change the data access code, 
which is fairly generic. But someone was clever and made it not so generic in application two. So now someone has to go through and figure out what the, the actual changes should be. So you end up making this code more fragile just because we're, we're trying to move changes back and forth. So how could we modularize or package this app to be a little bit more manageable or sane? I'm just going to throw out some ideas. Uh, idea number one is, uh, let's look at email sending. That is fairly generic. An email is just essentially a list of people you're sending to, whether it's the two line, the CC, or the BCC. You have a subject line, and you have a body of the email. And that body could be text or it could be HTML. And it might have attachments. And that's kind of the basis for sending email. Well, what if we made that a package with all the different combinations that we might possibly want for sending email? And we, we, we check that out. That's one example. Uh, credit card processing, fairly simple. You're probably not processing it directly. You might be going through another provider, so like a Stripe or a um, uh, authorized.net. So that's, that's fine. You can abstract that out and just say, OK, well, I want a method or something that just processes credit cards. Given a number or a token and an amount and some meta details, let's go process a credit card. That's not something that should be embedded directly into the app. Uh, caching, you know, caching is another thing. If we're standardized against ca um, caching in Redis or we're caching in memory, we can abstract that out into a package and reuse it in multiple places that we do caching. All right. I'm even going to suggest that maybe your data access layer could be abstracted out. Uh, we've done this in several cases where we'll have a generic repository model or um, a generic service model that knows how to make calls to a database. And we, we, we don't wrap the, the SQL calls directly. But what we might do is say, well, we make queries the same way, or we call store procedures the same way in all these different applications. Let's abstract that out into its own package and just reuse it in multiple places. So if you adopt this model of modularizing, ah, that's a hard word to say over and over again. Uh, so you package up your application. And we'll leave things like authentication alone, because authentication probably is uh, unique to the app. Random business logic is going to be unique to the app. That's not something that we necessarily need to package up. Um, user management is probably unique to the app. And you know, background process is probably unique to the app. So that's stuff that we don't necessarily need to reuse in multiple places. But if we go with this modular system, if I have app one and app two, well, if we use our previous example, someone makes a change to email sending or caching or data access, well, I don't make that change in app one and in app two. Instead, I make that change in the email sending uh, package, and that gets automatically pulled into app one or app two. So they get the benefit of the update without me having to worry about uh, copy and pasting into two different applications. Uh, the same thing with caching, the same thing with data access. We get the benefit of updating or fixing the code in one place, and then it's brought into where whichever application needs that change. Uh, what's even nicer about that is now everything's versioned. So I might have multiple versions of email sending that are currently going through my pipeline. And uh, I think I have a slide on it early, later, where I might have a version of my app that's running in uh, QA, it's going through testing, but then I have a version that's running in production. Well, if I fix, quote, fix a bug in email sending, I don't want to push that directly to production. I want to have the last known working version of email sending in production and I want the new version of email sending in QA so I can test and make sure everything works correctly. Well, now that everything's modular, I can do that testing and have a separate version of the package that's um, being, being tested and see if it's ready to go. All right. And packages doesn't necessarily just have to be your dependencies. Uh, so if we think of our cycle for development, um, 
we do our development, we push the source control, it goes through our build system. And then what if we took the package that gets built, whether it's a website or some, some other uh, artifact, and let's push that up into our package manager. So whether, say this is ProGit, and we create a package for the web app. Well then I could reuse that package to automatically deploy to QA. So QA, I'm not directly talking to my QA uh, <coughs> server, it's just getting a package deployed to it and that's what runs. Well once that package is approved and ready to go, maybe we want to move up, um, I have, I switched everything around. Um, but I can have different environments. So I have QA, I can have dev, I can have production. So once something is blessed in QA, I can move that exact package, unchanged, unmodified in any way, into production, and I'm running the same code in production that I had approved in QA. Um, if you're using other processes, maybe accidentally something could change between the build release to QA and the build release to production, where uh, maybe some little variable changes uh, unattendedly. But if you're packaging everything up, what you get deployed is gonna be exactly the same in both places. Uh, anyone doing Docker, Docker kind of uses the same concept with uh, images and containers. So if you build an image and you create multiple containers with that image, you're getting the exact same thing every single time and they can prove it uh, with the hashes. So you know exactly what you're getting. So it's important to keep in mind, not all packages are created equal. I showed a slide a couple, uh, a couple slides ago, we talked about NPM, NuGet, um, Ruby gems, if you're doing Python, you have pip. Uh, they're all different. So depending on the type of development you're doing, which package manager do you use? Well, I'm primarily a .NET guy. So if I'm building .NET modules, I'm probably going to build those uh, into NuGet packages. And I'll store them in a NuGet manager. Anything I'm doing in JavaScript, I'll probably build as NPM packages because it's easier to consume it through NPM than with any other mechanism. Uh, likewise, if I was doing Ruby, I would build a gem. But um, you have to pick the protocol that's best for your environment. You're not going to put JavaScript into a NuGet package because that's not the best place to consume it. Uh, likewise, you're not going to put C Sharp or uh, .NET assemblies into NPM packages. It's not the best way to consume it. You actually end up doing more work to consume the package than you probably should. Uh, but then you have cases where, on my previous slide, you might take your entire uh, deployment, package it up, so it can get deployed to different environments. Well, this doesn't fit any of the molds. You don't put that package into NuGet or NPM or so on. Instead, you might want a more universal package format, which is what uh, UPAC is for. Or, I didn't put it in here, but it's universal packaging. And it's just, universal packaging is a fancy way of saying it's a zip file that has some metadata. That's really all it is. And, all right, they, so all the packages live in their third party um, package managers, but your, I don't know about you, but I've been in several places where that's a concern. Like I'm getting my code from this third party source that I don't control, uh, but my developers are going there freely and pulling stuff down. So they're getting the latest version of Angular or they're getting the latest version of JSON.net. And I haven't tested these libraries. Uh, there have been several cases where people have hijacked packages. Um, NPM is especially bad about this, where NPM wasn't properly controlling the owner of a package. Someone gave up ownership of a very popular package and injected some malware into it. So every build system in the world that pulled that package, by default, injected themselves with this malware. That's a bit of a security concern. So any person who was managing uh, packages in-house probably would say, I want good control about what packages my developers are using. Uh, you might even have licensing concern. So if you don't 
uh, want to support uh, MIT license or uh, the Oracle whatever ever license. I can never keep track of the licensing. Um, but you might have restrictions. We can't use this license for this reason. Well, NPM, NuGet, they're not going to stop you. They're just going to say, well, here's the package, go use it. Well, what do you do in these cases? Uh, or more importantly, your internal packages. <laughs> you don't want to put your internal uh, code out on a public repository, do you? So in these cases, where do you put it? Well, ProGit, you should use ProGit for that stuff. Because ProGit will let you create either public repositories if you want them, or you can create internal uh, security-backed repositories. So maybe uh, only certain people can have access to the, the production uh, level packages. So anything that we will ever push to our, to our production environment, well, those are in a special feed that can only be accessed by certain people or certain processes. We don't give access to that to, to all the developers. Developers only get access to the development branch for, for testing purposes. And then those packages get used, they have to get approved by an administrator, and later they can get blessed into the production feed. <coughs> all right. Uh, and then things like security. So if you are worried about licensing, you can tell ProGit, never show me a package that has MIT licensing. Um, I just, I can't use it, so don't show it to me. Um, and then you can selectively say, well, don't show me jQuery ever because we don't want to use jQuery. Don't give me React if we're an Angular shop. It's, it's a great way to finely tune what your developers can and can't see. Uh, and then finally for internal packages, you could have a private repository that all your staff can see, but no one externally can see it. So if you care about that sort of thing, you should really take a look at ProGit. So kind of recapping, um, you know, managing dependencies, difficult. If you have to do everything by hand, have to do it manually, uh, it can be a real tax on your human labor. Uh, if you go back to my early slide where there were three developers trying to get uh, someone on-ramped, well, that's, if that's a multi-hour, multi-day process, how much money are you wasting getting that one developer up and running? If they were just using packages, and I could just pull the code out of source, install all the packages, and go, that would make life so much easier. Um, so we can decouple the monolith by going through and saying, here are the bits that we can safely abstract out, and let's turn these into packages so we can test them by themselves, we can maintain them by themselves, and then finally distribute them to the applications that need to use them. Uh, so, but all the packages, it's a zip file, or it's some sort of container file that has a manifest that tells you what's inside of the package. All major software platforms, if you're .NET, Ruby, Python, PowerShell, uh, you have a, a feed that you can access. But if you don't want to use the public feeds, you can use ProGit to have everything internal. And the most important part is that we're taking a monolithic application and turning it into more bite-sized chunks that we can better maintain. And we can drastically reduce the, the chance of tumbling down our house of cards. Um, but with that, uh, any questions, discussion? Fantastic. It's a little warm in here. Usually I think it's just me, but I think it's really the temperature. Alexa, all right. Well, if you all have questions or anything, feel free to contact me.